Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. This week, one of the books that Pastor Wilson mentions is The Princess and Curdy. Cannonball Books recently published that very book with a brand new cover from Forrest Dickinson and an intro from Dr. Timothy Larson. The adventures of Curdy and Princess Irene continue in George MacDonald's classic sequel to Princess and the Goblin. Two years have passed since Curdy uncovered the goblin's plot to kidnap the princess. Now the king is deathly ill and a new threat is lurking inside the palace walls. Join the miner's son and an unlikely companion as they embark on a mission to save Princess Irene and her father from the plot to usurp the kingdom. Get The Princess and Curdy, as well as The Princess and the Goblin, with brand new covers and introductions from Dr. Timothy Larson today at canonpress.com. Welcome to the podcast, episode 172. Thank you for sticking with me for 172 episodes of these things, assuming, of course, that you've been with me from the beginning, or assuming, of course, that you have gotten the, the Canon app and you have gone into the archives and you have binge listened. Anyway, thank you for being with, with me all this time. So uh, this is the podcast. I'm Douglas Wilson. This is episode 172. I want to talk a little bit about the blight of ideology, the blight of ideology. And I'm talking here about political theory. One of the things that Eric Hoffer argues in his book, The True Believer, is that there's a certain kind of ideological mindset where there's a certain kind of person, a certain kind of personality that just needs to be told which flag to fly and which direction to march and who to point the gun at. And this kind of personality uh, is out there, and it explains conversions from fascism to communism and back again. It is an idea. So the, the 20th century and the 21st century so far have been ideological ages. Now, if you read, uh, and if you read in the history of conservatism, let's say starting with Edmund Burke, or you... Um, read uh, Russell Kirk's book, The Conservative Mind, or you, you read uh, Richard Weaver's um, Ideas Have Consequences, one of the things you're going to encounter as you are dealing with the conservative mind is that it, there's a strong anti-ideological streak in conservatism. Now, that doesn't mean that conservatives don't believe certain things or that we wouldn't deny certain things. It's just that we are very distrustful of ideas that are disembodied and pinned to a card like they were part of your bug collection. So another way of putting this is uh, you should dance with the one what brung you. You should play cards with the hand that you're dealt. So it doesn't make sense, for example, to a conservative. To a conservative, it doesn't make sense. To say, here is the, um, come up with the perfect political system. And the ideal political system is a political system that could be implemented in any society at any time, and it would be self-evidently just and right and true. That's simply not possible. It's not realistic to expect people to function that way. You have to start where you are. So, as uh, my father is fond of saying, um, God takes you from where you are, not from where you should have been. And what happens is if you were to successfully get 15 churches planted in a Muslim country, the route that that country would take getting to a just biblical moral order would be a very different route than if you planted churches in an animist culture or a Confucian culture. You can't expect the non-believers to respond to what you're saying in identical ways when they are not adherents of identical positions. They've worshipped different gods. Their worldview, their systems are very different. And so, 
if you're a Christian conservative, that means that you believe that you, the, the non-negotiables would be things like Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus is Lord and we must confess that he is Lord and we must worship him every Lord's day. But the route that your civic discipleship will take is going to be very different. So one of, And this is one of the things that Jesus commanded us to do in the Great Commission. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go disciple the nations. So the verb there is disciple, and the direct object of that verb is nations, ethnoi. So all the tribes out there are to be discipled. But you can't just go out there and say, I've got a discipleship program that is going to be identical. It's going to be the same thing that I'm going to take everybody through. Suburban soccer moms, country club uh, bank presidents, meth addicts, homeless bums, everybody gets the same discipleship regimen. Anybody who does discipleship work at all knows that that is going to end in disaster because the, the country club bank president and the soccer mom and the meth addict are all uh, sinning in different ways. They need to be brought to Christ's way of living by different means. You have to teach them different things. They have to unlearn different things. So consequently, when the gospel came to uh, the Roman Empire, there were certain things that had to go first. And one of the things that went, one of the momentous events in all of Western history was Constantine's order that the pagan sacrifices be ceased, be, be, be stopped. Uh, that was a monumental uh, transition point. But suppose you had a country where that was not what was going on. Suppose it was another form of idolatry. Suppose it was another difficulty. So, the blight of ideology is this. You have a system, and it's a very tight system. It works out well on the blackboard. You can reduce it. You can write the basic tenets of it down on a three-by-five card, and it's clean and pure. And you want to impose it everywhere. Well, this is the blight of ideology. We don't, uh, Christians ought not to think ideologically. We believe in objective truth. We believe in fixed truth. Calling ideology a blight is not a surreptitious form of relativism. Jesus is Lord, and it's always true that he rose from the dead. And God's word is always to be our, our focus and our goal. God's law is to be implemented. But God's law cannot be implemented the same way everywhere because people are in different places. So we are continuing with the podcast, episode 172, and we've now come to our hamartiology section. Having considered the verb that means to blaspheme and the noun that means blasphemy, our pursuit of hamartiology brings us now to the adjective blasphemos, which is in English blasphemous. Well, I shouldn't say it is blasphemous. It means blasphemous. So in Acts 6.11, then they suborned men which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So these are men who, are, who had been bested by Stephen in debate. And just a side observation, the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, shows up for the very first time in the New Testament at the stoning of Stephen. He was uh, holding the coats of the witnesses who had uh, said this, the, the suborned men who said that Stephen was speaking blasphemy. Well, what happened there was, I'll put it this way, men from the synagogue of the freedmen uh, debated with Stephen, and they got their socks rolled down around their ankles and their togas pulled over their heads. Stephen handily routed them. And it says the men from the synagogue of the freedmen were from various places, and one of the places was Cilicia. Well, the principal city in Cilicia was Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus, I think, was one of the people who was bested in debate by Stephen. I also think that the Apostle Paul was a world-class genius, a very brilliant man. And in his unregenerate state, I don't think he would have taken very well to being beaten in a debate by a deacon. And so he suborns, he was one of the people, I think, who suborns the men to testify against him. And one of the, th the things they say is that he spoke blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And then just a few verses later, 
and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and against the law. So, ironically, um, Stephen is accused of speaking against Moses and against the holy place and so on. Well, when the Jews said, We know that God spoke with Moses, well, how did they know that? Well, Moses performed great miracles, right? Oh, like Stephen. Stephen performs miracles. Well, when Moses came down from the mountain, his face was radiant and shining. Oh, like Stephen's face was shining like the face of an angel? So, it's very clear that Stephen is the heir of Moses. But Stephen is standing in the place of Moses, and he's accused of blaspheming the holy place, and so the whole thing is, is false. But the sin that they're accusing him of is a real sin. It really is a sin to, to be blasphemous that way. It's simply a false accusation. In 1 Timothy 1.13 and 2 Timothy 3.2, the adjective refers to a blasphemer. This often happens where an adjective is made to stand in for a noun, as when in English we say the good die young. The good there is shorthand for the good people or the good man. The good men die young. So, but we just say the good die young. Uh, so, when you use blasphemous, uh, that can stand in for the blasphemous man or, put another way, the blasphemer. First Timothy 1.13 says, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So, notice that Paul here describes his unregenerate state very clearly. He says he was a blasphemer. He says he was a persecutor. He says he was injurious. In 2 Timothy 3.2, it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, there it is, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I've said before that sins are like grapes, they come in bunches, and here we have uh, all these sins together, coveting, boasting, pride, blaspheming, and so on. And then the last rendition for this word is railing, from 2 Peter 2.11. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. So, this kind of railing, this kind of vituperation is... Um, is out. It's a very clear sin. So, we're continuing on with the podcast, episode 172. Uh, the book I'd like to review uh, here is The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald. So, I read uh, the Curdie books. There's two bo books, The Princess and the Goblin and The Princess and Curdie by George MacDonald, and I read them both well, probably 40 years ago, a long, long time ago. And in the midst of time, I, I, I could remember them and I knew, basically, the only thing I knew about these books was that I had, in fact, read them before. Uh, but I, I couldn't remember any, any details or any of the plot points or anything like that. So, um, I recently decided to go through them again and went through The Princess and the, Gob uh, Princess and the Goblin and then The Princess and Curdie. And I'd like to make two. Uh, the first, there are a lot. They were a lot of fun. If you've uh, not read, if you're looking for good, wholesome uh, books for your kids to read, or if you're looking for books to read to your kids, these two are some good ones. Now, George MacDonald, some of his stuff just leaves me cold. And you have to keep in mind that he, that George MacDonald had a lot of kids, and he was having to pay the bills, and he would crank out certain books just to pay the bills. But some of his books, I think, are going to have staying power. And I think the Curdy books are uh, in that category. I think they're going to stay in print for a long time, and, and they're worth reading. But not everything by MacDonald is worth reading. Some of his stuff gets a little esoteric and bizarre. And there are some elements in these two books that are like that, but not so much that it wrecks them. They're very pleasant, very fun reading. The two things that I would point out about these books is that well, I'll put it this way. C.S. Lewis considered George MacDonald his master, and they both do the same thing here. When they have children who are heroes or heroines, in this case, uh, Curdie and the Princess Irene, when the, he's got a protagonist who's a kid, uh, he is, MacDonald takes sin seriously. In, in other words, the sin and the failings and the difficulties and the challenges and the temptations to put self first are temptations that 
are very evident and very present, and the kids sin. And Lewis does the same thing with his uh, kids in the Narnia stories, where you don't have kids that are too good to be true on the one hand, and neither do you have the snapping and the quarreling and the biting that is just treated as part of normal life where there isn't repentance or there isn't some sort of restoration or there isn't some sort of correction. MacDonald is very clear on this sort of thing. When, when any of the children start to drift off or start to, to be disobedient or start to fall into unbelief, he's very careful to bring it back to the right place. He's very, very careful to make sure that things get uh, restored. And th- there's, um, there are descriptions and adventures and that sort of thing that are, uh, you're, if you read the, these to your kids, uh, they will enjoy them uh, very much. I, enj- I enjoyed the goblins being um, worthy of being slain, but nowhere near uh, the orc category. Of, uh, they're nowhere near as nasty as, uh, well, they're nasty, but they're nowhere near as formidable as uh, Tolkien's orcs. Uh, they are they are hobgoblins more than anything else. The other thing about uh, MacDonald is, um, and I don't know what precisely to make of this, MacDonald was something of a romantic writer, not, not in the sense of um, guy-girl romances, but in the sense of uh, like the, the German romantic uh, movement. He, he was a romantic, and one of the things that uh, one of the characters who shows up in both books is um, uh, the great-great-grandmother of Irene, and uh, as sort of a fairy godmother figure. Uh, and uh, she is so wise and so together and so numinous and so complete that uh, you begin to, by the end of the second book, I was suspecting uh, some sort of um, Mother Mary hunger in a Protestant. There's something about this feminine archetype who's watching over you, who is taking care of you, who's providing you with everything you need for life and godliness, which the great, great, great grandma, fairy godmother um, queen does first for Irene and the princess and the goblin, and then next for Curdie and the princess and Curdie. It's delightful. It's edifying. It's engaging, but it's not altogether Protestant. So just put that little tick mark against it, but still enjoy it. Mm-hmm.